Hi, my name is George Dahl and welcome to my film journal. Today I have a very special treat for everybody. I'm going to go in depth, take a deep dive into the airport series of 1970s disaster films. Starting with the original, 1970s Airport. Then going on to Airport 1975, Airport 77, and then finally Airport the Concord 1977. 79. Yeah. Airport! Airport! Ah! Hold on! So in the 1970s, there was a very palatable craze for disaster films. The Towering Inferno, The Poseidon Adventure, Earthquake, and the progenitor of them all, Airport, made in 1970, which was based on a very popular novel of the day. The film stars Burt Lancaster and Dean Martin. Uh, Dean Martin, who you uh, people of my generation probably know best from his Christmas music. But he was actually a, a, a fine and charismatic actor. Uh, I would recommend maybe not checking out and watching, but at least knowing that the Matt Helm series of films exists. Uh, it was a 1970s parody of James Bond starring Dean Martin as a sort of uh, over-the-top womanizing spy. I want to catch you right near Duluth. Well, that's my best feature. Right now, you just lower your left arm because we don't want to hide the Twin Cities. And they're uh, little interesting cultural artifacts. <laughs> Put me down. You don't have time to sit around drinking. You've got work. The film also stars Van Heflin, a classic film star as well as Jean Seberg, uh, the beautiful actress from uh, most famously Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, who also sort of, uh, her, her career sort of fell off around this time. This is about the last big movie she did because she was a target in the uh, FBI's Cointelpro operation. Uh, so basically she was targeted by J. Edgar Hoover as a dissident a public figure because she was giving money to the NAACP, some of the Black Panthers, etc. So they planted malicious fake stories about her pregnancy being the product of a secret tryst between her and a member of the Black Panthers. This, she claimed, caused her such distress that she did, in fact, give early birth to the child, and it was revealed that it was, in fact, a lie and really the product of her husband. Um, after that, they continued to intimidate her and follow her, and they did uh, wiretap her phones. This was all discovered in the late 90s after Clinton declassified a lot of things, and through FOIA requests, we found that this uh, was happening to this poor woman. Uh, but she's, she shines here, so lest her memory be uh, disgraced in such a way, enjoy her in this film. And for the most part, the performances are really good. This being the prototype for the disaster film, not all the tropes line up exactly with the films that would come after it. For instance, this movie, based on a book, obviously, is much more concerned with an airport. Only in the final third act do we uh, catch up with the action on a plane as it is uh, careening towards its uh, demise. So the movie is sort of like a part soap opera. It deals with Burt Lancaster, who is the sort of uh, overworked head of an airport in Chicago. He sort of has a failed marriage and a little bit of a thing with Gene Seberg. Dean Martin is having troubles. He's kind of a player, playboy kind of guy, hanging out with all the stewardesses to find out only that, that uh, one of them is actually uh, pregnant with his child. So he has a little bit of a moral dilemma there. There's a sort of a familial drama between Van Heflin and his wife as he is a sort of ne'er-do-well guy and he's planning on blowing up one of the planes overhead in order to cash in on an insurance policy. And of course, lest we forget, we have George Kennedy here playing Joe Petroni, the sort of factotum of the airport, who helps to clear the runway so that the plane can land safely. It's, you know, it's very high suspense and tension. And uh, he's the only element of continuity that carries through all four films. He gets little bit parts and you generally he's working on the ground until in part four, which we'll get to, he has his moment to shine as the captain of the Concorde. But we'll get to that later. Airport is very sort of classically shot. There was a critic who sort of deridedly referred to it as the best film of 1944. Because while the 1970s might seem like a you know long time for us, at the time this movie was released, it was a big studio release by Universal. Easy Rider was coming out, Five Easy Pieces, Bonnie and Clyde, and the Hollywood system was like irrevocably shifting and changing. It almost seems like an anachronism from the old Hollywood period, because the movie looks like it could have been shot in 1960, honestly. The film was a gigantic hit for Universal. I think they spent $13 million on it. The studio was worried that it was going to be a disaster, but when it came out, it grossed almost $100 million, and it became their biggest grossing film of all time. So therefore, a sequel was put into production. The thing about Airport that really does work, in which uh, elements that falter in the later films, is that you really do care about the cast. 
Uh, you get to spend a lot of time with them in the actual airport, and there's a lot of buildup. You're invested in the drama before finally they're confronted with the sort of careening death of the third act. No, 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 you stay where you are. Guerrero, listen to me. You'll kill yourself for nothing if you explode that bomb. So therefore, the movie has, it's got a lot of feeling and passion. Um, I would say the airport films are most notable, uh, looking back, as the influence for Airplane. And that parody has actually become more culturally relevant than the thing that it is actually lampooning. That's actually what provoked me to start watching these films in the first place, is number one, I wanted to do a retrospective of 70s disaster films as a little element of research for a book I'm writing on 70s filmmaking. I thought I would start with the Airplane films because I do so love Airplane from 1979, the Zucker Brothers movie, which I loved as a kid, still holds up, very, very funny. I love to show it to people for the first time because there are so many great jokes that will be funny till the end of time, especially with the inclusion of Leslie Nielsen, who's just timeless. Sir, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry I have to wake you. Are you a doctor? That's right. We have some passengers that are very sick. Could you come take a look at them? But I think people coming to the airport series, watching especially this first one, they're not going to find a whole lot to compare with uh, Airplane. Partially because Airplane is not really parodying Airport. It is really going after the subsequent films of the series, especially Airplane 2, otherwise known as Airport 1975. So the climate of filmmaking was very, very different in the 1970s than it was today. Sequels did not have the same sort of gravitas or weight applied to them as they do now. Everyone, you know, oh, the sequel, oh, Empire Strikes Back is much better than Star Wars, etc., etc. Godfather 2 is even better. But the stigma was different back then. People always assumed that the sequel would be sort of a cheap rehash rushed out for cash. And for a while, um, that's exactly what it was. And that's exactly what this film is, uh, too. And which is so surprising why Charlton Heston would decide to headline it because this is the guy who balked at returning for Beneath the Planet of the Apes. I think they actually paid him a million dollars to appear in that film. But the budget was significantly less for this movie. It cost $3 million. And Charlton Heston, I imagine, probably took one of that because I don't know why he would want to appear in this sequel and not Planet of the Apes, which is actually a series I should also delve into on a future review. I would love to do that. I love those films. So I don't get it. But he basically phones it in. He just finished wrapping the filming of Earthquake, and he said in his autobiography that he had really 15 hours in between doing Earthquake and coming in to do this film, which he doesn't actually is not asked to do a whole lot of work here in this movie. He is uh, has a relationship that's sort of on the rocks with Karen Black, a stewardess. He's a pilot. She goes up on the plane. The plane is sabotaged by a guy who has a heart attack in a small plane, and it crashes right into the cockpit, sucking out the pilot as well as... Uh, Eric Estrada, in I think probably one of his first movies where he plays sort of like the perverted like Mexican like pilot guy who's always like hitting on everybody and he gets sucked out right quick, he's gone, uh, which is unfortunate. And that's something that happens with a lot of the cast. They're introduced in maybe 10 minutes and then basically their only function for the rest of the film is just to react to all the danger and disaster that's going on. Charlton Heston doesn't have to do much. For the most part, he hangs out with George Kennedy on the ground, talking fervently into the microphone, saying, oh, we gotta do these things. We have to save the plane. And that's mostly just cutting back and forth because Karen Black is getting the, given the duties of having to pilot the ship by herself, which is, as you remember, the major plot line in Airplane. As well as what we see in Airplane, um, a poor sick girl played by Linda Blair, who obviously was from Exorcist fame, uh, being sung to by a nun on a guitar and everybody in unison on the plane, dancing along joyfully. You know, uh, the, little do they know they're about to experience a disaster. Well, the disaster does strike. The movie really hits its stride. It happens like 20 minutes in. Compare that to the last half hour of the first Airplane film. Uh, the movie is not really inter interested in characters at all. It's interested in suspense, tension, action. And that will carry through through the rest of the series because very similarly to, say, the Halloween films. So Halloween comes out, first one's a big hit. They don't come out with a sequel for three years. And in that intermittent time, people are coming out with Terror Train, Friday the 13th. And then by the time Halloween 2 comes out, it's no longer the standard bearer. It has to catch up and sort of ape the tropes of its copycats which uh, the Poseidon Adventure had already come out, and that's a full-blown disaster film right off the bat. It's very good, by the way, though, I would say. This movie's got to outpace or match its contemporaries. So it's just all plain disaster all the time. Uh, but one thing about the movie that's, that's really wonderful is that the exterior shots of the plane flying low through these mountains, they're incredible. 
and they're the last time that this sort of like in-air photography would be attempted in the films as save for a few shots in part three most of it is just blue screen models flying around and they, they do not look very good this however though it's magnificent stuff, especially when it gets to the climax and Charlton Heston has to be skyhooked into the plane, flying out of a helicopter and landing onto the cockpit and climbing in to fly it to safety. So that is really epic and impressive stuff, real stunts that I think people really crave, and it still looks impressive today. So we will wrap up our discussion of part two and continue on to part three. The tradition of motion picture excitement continues. Airport 77. So a hallmark of the 70s disaster film is to feature a large cast, and you often have new up-and-coming stars, established A-listers, as well as the old guard. So in this film we have Jack Lemmon as the captain, we've got Christopher Lee as a sort of character actor element, we've got Joseph Cotton as the old guard, though I, I know he was in the movie, but I can't for the life of me even remember his part. And then you have Jimmy Stewart who plays this sort of rich uh, billionaire guy who is expecting his brand new plane to show up on his island and it's carrying some of his uh, money and art as well as his uh, daughter and grandson. Considering the plane is carrying such precious cargo, it is hijacked by sort of art thieves and terrorists and they gas and knock everybody out on the plane. They're all, they're all uh, subdued while they attempt to steal art, but these uh, buffoons crash into uh, an oil rig and therefore the plane careens right underwater. Uh, obviously aping the success of the Poseidon adventure. Water is spilling in, it's a great suspense tactic, but uh, one thing that's missing by the fact that the whole cast is gassed out is that there's no sort of like reaction to, hold on everybody, put your seat belts on, ah! which is, you know, a lot of the suspense, and that's a lot of the fun of the movie is to see the reaction as everything starts to go wrong as it was, you know, previously idyllic and wonderful earlier. The plane is a really, really cool private plane with kick-ass wood paneling, and they've got a built-in Pong cabinet in there, which is it's just high-tech, awesome stuff. So water starts filling in, everyone's freaking out once they've revived themselves from the gas, and then uh, the shag carpeting is ruined, obviously, and Jack Lemmon has to hatch a plan. So he gets in a dinghy boat and floats up to the surface where he finds a big cruise ship, lights off a flare, gets on board, and the U.S. Navy is called in to save the day. This is an element that was introduced in part two. Whereas the part one was a very egalitarian film about people working together in sort of an office setting. Like, we're all, this is just another day at the airport. We're all working together to, to prevent this catastrophe. And at the end of the day, we're all going to come together and be closer. Our narratives are clearly established. Our interpersonal uh, relationships are clearly established. This movie, not so. Everybody is just sort of a character type. Uh, the old lady, uh, the young kids, the drunk uh, wife of the billionaire industrialist Christopher Lee. Uh, who is dispatched fairly early, unfortunately. It's really a shame. And at the end, the catharsis of the whole thing is just, hey, we're off the boat. The end. No real denouement or anything. And, and this is another element that was established in the second film that sort of undercuts the egalitarian nature of it and reinforces the sort of like magisterium of, of the sort of state actors. And it becomes almost like a Michael Bay film where it's like, hey, let's stop the movie right now because I want to see Air Force pilots jump out of a plane with wingsuits. You know, just because I want to showcase like how cool military tech is. And that happens in this movie too. Like the last like 30 minutes, the cast is forgotten and it's all about military procedure and the grandeur of the Navy. This sort of conservative element sort of entered into the film in the 70s too, in, the, in part two it entered the series, when Charlton Heston and George Kennedy are attempting to help land the plane with Karen Black flying. And a sort of nosy, parasitic reporter shows up and says, don't the people have the right to know about the plane? And they like violently eject him from the control tower. And George Kennedy says, sometimes the public's right to know is a real pain in my ass. I don't, I note that not to critique it, but it's interesting to see that the, that sort of conservative strain entering these big budget studio films and how diametrically opposed they are to, say, the new Hollywood movie brats like Martin Scorsese and their more egalitarian, liberal view of filmmaking. So at the end of part three, everybody is saved, and George Kennedy, though he has a small bit part, gets his moment to shine by, by talking to Jimmy Stewart, who's very worried. My grandson's up there in that plane. And at the end, is there really any sort of unification moment where they get together and hug? Not really. Last shot of Jimmy Stewart is just him going, ha, ha, ha. But the audience doesn't care because they came to see a big show, a big disaster, and they got it, and they were satisfied. But the one thing that Airport 3 has over the film that would be the nail in the coffin for the series, Airport 4, is that you do really like Jack Lemmon. You care a little bit about him and his girlfriend. Um, there are some characters who are likable. You want people to succeed. Not everybody is wholly unlikable. And the film 
is not ludicrous and over the top in a way that's out of bounds for the disaster film. And this is a sort of, you know, still humanitarian element that will completely crumble and, and fall into shambles in the disaster that is Airport 4. Airport 1980. The Concord. So as these films stand at the end of part three, after eschewing any sort of business and drama or romance happening at the airport and deciding we're going to constrict the action simply to the plane because that's where the action's taking place, the movie sort of handicaps themselves uh, just by virtue of their own premises. How much can you possibly do on a plane? All the action is really confined to the cockpit and everybody's you know pulling levers and going and reacting and then calling back to base. And all that the cast in the main cabin has to do is scream and react and stay in their seats and hug each other. Compare that to the Poseidon Adventure, where there is initial disaster, and then character traits and motivations are revealed as the company of our characters traverse through the upended boat. And we get to learn about people as they go along. Whereas in this airplane movie, all you have are just, just constant full throttle death all the way, and it can become sort of numbing, especially once you get to a fourth film in the series. So the producers of the film badly wanted uh, the Concorde jet to be featured in one of the previous films so they could never get the rights to it. Unfortunately for the people representing the Concorde, uh, they finally broke through with part four. George Kennedy gets his moment to shine, and he and Alain Delon, who uh, is a French actor famous for uh, appearing in Le Samurai and other Jean-Pierre Melville French films, uh, which Jean-Pierre Melville out of the French New Wave, my favorite director, Le Circle Rouge, wonderful. Bob Le Flamour, check him out. Unfortunately, their presence is really not enough to carry the film, and the cast has sort of really been downgraded. Even though the budget was higher than part three, a lot of it's sp spent on special effects, uh, which are hideous, especially in the wake of Star Wars. You'd expect a lot better. To give you an idea of the over-the-top absurdity of <laughs> Airport 1979, there's a sequence in which, flying the Concorde jet, uh, they're being pursued by a, a, a heat-seeking missile. I'll get to it. And George Kennedy opens the door of the cockpit and shoots a flare gun out of the cockpit so that the uh, missile will, will be drawn to the heat, which I, I guess is, is more of a strong signal than a giant plane. Whatever. Anyway, that's the real problem with this movie is it is so over the top and ridiculous. Some critics have even gone so far as to say it's so bad it's entertaining. I would disagree. The film is disjointed. Uh, it's, it's, the characters are just complete characterizations and goofballs, especially J.J. Walker from Good Times fame, whose sole characteristic is he likes to play the saxophone on this plane and just walk around the aisles and play saxophone. Nobody has a problem with this. There are also two girls who are dancing to a little beatbox little next to him. This plane is out of control. Plus, he's smoking weed every five minutes in the uh, plane, uh, and that's supposed to be really hilarious. There's also an actress, this poor actress, who's, who's, uh, whose only job and only character trait in the film is that when she gets nervous, she goes to the bathroom. And this joke is, like, just totally beaten like a dead horse, like, eight times. She'll come out of the bathroom and be like, oh, I, I have to go to the bathroom because I'm nervous. And then George Kennedy would be like, we're going to get blown up by a bomb. And then she'll go, oh, I have to go back in the bathroom now. And I don't know who's who's laughing at this. It's, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely hideous. So the villain of our piece is uh, Robert Wagner with his strong, firm jaw and menacing eyes. And many people our age might uh, remember him as number two from Austin Powers. Uh, nowadays, I think he's selling timeshares and gold to old people during the O'Reilly Factor or Eddie uh, Griffith reruns. But he plays a sinister character who's a weapons manufacturer, and it's foreshadowed at the beginning that he's testing his brand new missile on the same day that the Concorde's taking off. It's like a comical, goofy, like like James Bond, Connery era type like missile. It looks absolutely ludicrous. And uh, it's discovered by his investigative journalist girlfriend that he has actually been selling weapons to the Ayatollah and all such a, other sorts of uh, uh, loony characters. She doesn't know what to do with this information because she loves Robert Wagner so much. So he decides to uh, blow up the plane she's on with a missile in order to do away with her. This is interesting considering uh, that Robert Wagner is only two years divorced from the mysterious drowning death of his then wife, uh, Natalie Wood, who fell off a boat. And he was a person of interest in that murder. And here he is trying to blow up his girlfriend with a missile. Now, it doesn't work, thankfully. Uh, George Kennedy and Alan Delon are able to land the plane safely, like halfway through the movie, after dispensing with the crisis of the missile. Then you're kind of left wondering, well, there's 40 more minutes left to this movie. 
So the everybody goes to France. Uh, we discover that George Kennedy's wife has died. So Alan DeLong procures for him a prostitute, and they share a lovely night together. Yes, you get to see shirtless George Kennedy draped in a fur blanket, making love to this uh, woman with a perm in front of the fire, and it's like just hideous. You want to divert your eyes and look away. After that, uh, he confronts Alan DeLong and says, I had a great night last night. Wow, was it great. And then Alan DeLong says, well, for that kind of money, it better be. And rather than, like, reacting in, like, shock and horror and being uh, very, very sad and d disillusioned that this woman who he thought he was in love with turns out to be a prostitute, what does Kennedy do? He just goes, ah, you son of a bitch, you really got me there. And I'm thinking, what is happening in this film? Meanwhile, during all this uh, romance, our character, the investigative journalist, meets with Robert Wagner, is fully aware of the fact that he shot a missile to blow her up. He tried to blow up the missile. But but she just cannot reconcile this fact that her boyfriend is, like, a, a hideous murderer. And so she goes, I don't know what I'm going to do with this information that I have, but I still love you, god damn it. And then he, then, uh, I, so, unfazed by the fact that uh, her boyfriend tried to blow up with a missile, she gets back on the plane. It made an emergency landing in, uh, in, uh. France, but it needs to go to, I don't know, America or Russia or somewhere because the whole Russian Olympic team is on the plane and uh, that's supposed to create some sort of tension. There's like a, there's a, there's a swimmer on the team who's Russian and she's in love with a, a guy with hideous 70s hairdo. Then they're back in the air. Everything seems fine. Half an hour left. At this point, I am like checking my phone. I want to slip my wrist. Uh, there's more. Uh, Robert Wagner sends jet fighters after the plane to shoot it down. They evade the jet fighters. I had no sympathy for this investigative reporter woman because this is all her fault. She should have turned in Robert Wagner, but instead uh, she might die again. He's going to try again. I don't know how you'd cover this up. Oh, what a crazy coincidence. Someone tried to blow up the... Uh, they're going to pretend that it's been diverted off course, the missile, and then they land safely, and then jet fighters try to blow it up? Jesus Christ. It's a hideous film. Uh, eventually they land in the Alps, the plane blows up, and I switched it off immediately. So... The Airplane series really ended on a sour note, and it kind of did end the disaster genre in general. After that, the whole thing was sort of put to rest. It had a nice 10-year run, but the 80s uh, had a lot of new things up their sleeves for everybody, and no one was really as much interested in the disaster film anymore. I, I wonder why. Hmm. I can't point to anything that's significantly political about it, like maybe someone would try to finagle it to say, oh, the Reagan conservative era ushered in a much more conservative era of individualism and so therefore the idea of a community working together to sort of wrench themselves out of a hideous disaster situation didn't appeal to the public anymore i think that could be kind of some dime store philosophy i don't think that's true because like i noted earlier the airplane films are very conservative and often focus on especially in the case of part two and part four the heroics of one man or two men to save the entire ship so i don't know how would I rate the airplane films overall? I'd say definitely Airport 1, though it's a little bit of an anachronism, is the best of the series. Airport 3 is probably better than Part 2, but not by much. And Airport 4 deserves to uh, spend a lot of time in, in, the, in the depths of a bargain bin. Though I did have to pay $3.99 to rent it. It's unfortunate. Um, I like these films. They're fine. I would say check them out if you're looking for an interesting laugh. Actually... I live-tweeted my watching of part two and three, and nobody cared. So, maybe someone will care about this video. Thanks for watching.